And so with clarity, I was like, I need to increase my faith and trust because in the end, like, and now I know, like, that's the highest emotion you could have, faith, trust, and love. Not happiness or contentment. Those are, faith, trust, and love are a much higher vibration than being happy. And so what does it look like when you walk on faith um, and say, this could be my path? It may not be clear to me, mm -hmm. but I know what tomorrow will bring. Hello, it's Lisa DeHart here. Thank you for tuning in to the coaching studio. I am excited to introduce you to Ebony Smith. She is a master certified coach for the International Coaching Federation and somebody who I'm very excited to have a conversation with today. Ebony, thank you so much for being on the coaching studio today. Thank you so much for having me. I really do appreciate the time we're going to spend together today. I am very much looking forward to it myself. Well, as you know, one of my first questions is I'm always fascinated by the origin story of how somebody ended up like through their career, ended up becoming an MCC coach and, and being in the seat that you're sitting in. Um, how did you, how did we end up here together in this, in this moment? Okay. So bear with me. I'm going to give you a little bit of a beginning. Beautiful. It all started in 2014. In 2014, I decided I was going to actually use all six weeks of my vacation that I had. And my what? <laughs> I'd never done it before. I was like the habitual two or three week carryover. I did a bit of hiking in the Andes. And then I also decided my number one bucket list place was going to Bhutan. And I was going to go do some hiking in the Himalayas. And for the first time in my career, I was taking a 21 day vacation. So I convinced some girlfriends to go with me. And so we're a group of five and we hit like a few we hit a few countries, but ended up spending about 10 days in Bhutan, hiking and meditating and just me being out of breath and throwing up from the altitude, but it was fantastic. <laughs> I came back really clear in who I was, not knowing that I was getting prepared. Mm. So that was November of 2014. Fast forward to January, 2015. And my company had been asking me to relocate. And I said, no. And then they made it an ultimatum. Oh. And for the first time, I had so much clarity from like the hiking and the, the rest um, that I picked me. I said, I'm going to take a bet on myself. And it came with a non-compete period where I knew I needed to be home. Uh, and I'd be out of the workforce for a little bit. And on that first mo Monday morning in 40 years, when I had no place to go for the first time in my life, because... I even had preschool before then, right? Um, I was like, I need help. And so I had reached out to a coach I'd worked with and we were kind of working on some things, but then I realized I needed more. And I was like, the cheapest way for me to do this is actually just to go to coaching school for my transformation. A friend suggested it to me. And so honestly, I, st I went to coaching school to work on myself because it was the economical way for me to get a personal transformation. And I thought it would make me a better leader when I went back into my corporate organization. You know, I think that's fascinating. So a couple things. One, taking 21 days off of vacation after what sounds like not really utilizing vacation very much, mm -hmm. that's an act of courage in and of itself. Um and I mean, it sounds, as you were speaking, you know, it sounds transformational. How, what was the transformation into choosing yourself and, and taking that bet on yourself? When you sit and you're meditating for a few hours at a time every day, and you see like monks and people happy and the mountains, the mountain air, it's pure, the, the pine trees. And I just came back like really well rested. And, you know, I was, I had been meditating then, but I wasn't deep in my practice. And I remember sitting with people that were, you know, they had master's degrees, PhDs, and these are the monks that were, that were at the temples that we were visiting. Like they, they're like, oh, we don't get to meditate till we're in graduate school. And you, right. Cause it's, it, it really is preparing them. And so when you're in monastic life, meditate, meditation has a different purpose. Mm. So I had a level of clarity and then I came back 
on that flight back. It was the longest flight leg I'd ever taken. It was 17 hours straight. Uh, almost, almost, it was like 16 hours and 40 minutes back home um, after my second connection. And <laughs> I was sitting there, I was like, what do I want to get from this? And I was like, you know what? I'm going to take better care of myself. I'm going to be truer to me. I'm going to use my values a little bit more as a compass. Um, and so when I got asked the question, I had a lot of clarity on picking me. I just wanted to pick me. Yeah. And so I think that was the thing that they didn't recognize. That they didn't know that they, they were talking to a new version of me. And I remember I used to always have a vision board party with my friends, like the Saturday after the new year weekend. Um, and I invite people, we have lunch, we do vision boards. And for the first time I got hypnotized on my vision board to hold it as a singular focus on helping me create a new version of my life. And so that was also helpful. Yeah. I'm really hearing like this, like intense awareness and focus towards this new, really new vision of how you want to be in the world. And, I, and so I hear you go into coaching school because it's going to make you a better leader within your organization who at this point has no clue who you are because you changed so radically in a month. Um, and, and what transpires that has you go, I forget about, this isn't just about me working on me. I mean, that's an element of it, but I like, I like this. Well, I think in uncertainty, you can get curious. And so during that period, when I was in that leave period, I just got curious. What are the things that I liked about being in an organization? What were the things that I, that made it harder? And I thought, okay, if I go to coaching school, it's going to make me a better leader. That way, the things I liked, which were working with um, more junior members of the team or supporting peers, that I would had the opportunity and I had better skills to engage with them deeply, right? And so I was at the point where I always say in organizations, there's two types of people. There are the people who make the revenue and the people who account for the revenue. And if you go beyond a certain point, the only thing you'll ever do is account for it. And I was still at the making it and managing teams level at the kind of at the global director level. And so I enjoyed that part of really understanding our business and what we were doing and making relationships. And so how could I do that better and deeper? Mm. So I wanted that in my next role. And so coaching school was going to help me build out those relationships. Well, and, and not to deviate too much here, but that's a really important concept, which is coaching makes a better leader. Mm -hmm. How do you see the leadership being a leader being impacted by for, not that they need to ever become a coach, like this is my full-time gig or anything like that, but how does, how does coaching development and coaching training help a leader be a better leader? You taught me how to listen. I like so many people and coaches know, you think you know how to listen, but you really don't, right? And so somehow the world shapes us that we're, we're waiting for people to stop speaking. And when you're in coaching school, you realize, oh, I really don't know how to listen. It's one of the first skills they teach you in addition to how to ask really great open-ended questions. Yeah. It was funny. I was just having this conversation with somebody yesterday because they're like, um, you know, how do you, how do you stay in a state of non-attachment to the outcome for the client? And I think that this is really kind of integrated into that also in the sense of we are taught to tell, we're taught to solve for, and that, that capacity to sit in the space of, and just hold the space and deeply listen to another human being as they're communicating, whatever it is that they're communicating is such an important skill set. And I think the like coaching school is one of the things that I see happen because it's a skill we aren't apparently, if we're born with it, it's cultured out of us. Um, <laughs> so 
<laughs> so, you know, however we get there, um, we end up learning these kind of speaker listener techniques, right? Like, Ebony, I just heard you say X, Y, Z, W, L, M, N, O, P. And, and in that way, I'm reflecting back to you. And I think there's also that trans transformation as we learn to listen at a deeper level where we're not just wrote reflecting back to you what I just heard you say, but rather listening to more of the key elements. And I think that's so crucial that you bring that up for, for leaders, for coaches, for human beings in relationship with other sentience in the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I think probably that was one of the, the, the things that I realized and realized then, and that I realized the more now um, people oftentimes want to be heard and the way you can respect that, even when you disagree, because sometimes we have to listen and signal receptiveness, but not agreement. Like I'm mm -hmm. receptive to the words that you're saying in no way. Do I agree with you? Absolutely. But, <laughs> and but so I you. <laughs> but I hear you, right. And I can, I can acknowledge and summarize and do all of those things that you're asking for and ask probing questions mm -hmm. that also don't signal agree uh, that I'm agreeing, but also okay. signal my receptiveness. And I think it's in that listening that great relationships are built. And so those are the way, those are the skills that I was grateful that I was acquiring. Cause I was like, oh, right away, this has applicability to real life. Yeah. And, you know, I remember my first peer coaching sessions and I actually was getting a, um, my person was someone who was transitioning out of being a psychiatrist and transitioning into coaching. Uh, and I was like, and so our sessions, because they were Ivy League educated psychiatrists, and they're like, I want to take a break from trauma. Yeah. I want to see what it's like to help people make a path forward and not help them clear a trauma that they've gone through. Because yeah. You know, my peer coach at the time, she's like, I've heard, I've heard and seen things that, that I would be okay if I didn't know, but I'm grateful I was able to help the people I was working with. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice to help people build lives. And yeah. so, and so, yeah, and I was surprised though, like you, other people, how many people in my class were therapists or we had just had the one psychiatrist, but I have friends that she's like, I was a therapist. She goes, I enjoyed therapy, but I enjoyed this part more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, we could go off on a whole tangent, but that would be not about you. So we're not going to, um, <laughs> but, but, that's, but, yeah. but, but that was one of the things like, what does it look like to deeply listen to other yeah. people and ask yeah. great questions and help them come up with a plan that moves forward. Yeah. And so it's inside of that practice and that, um, level of, upskilling, reskilling myself that I thought if I was ever going to do this full time, when would I do it besides now? Yeah. Cause putting it off, I mean, off and away and over there, it's just at some point your tomorrow self is going to look back and be like, why didn't I start this earlier? Mm -hmm. And so with clarity, I was like, I need to increase my faith and trust because in the end, like, and now I know, like, that's the highest emotion you could have faith, trust, and love, mm. if not happiness or contentment. Those of praise, faith, trust, and love are a much higher vibration than being happy. And so what does it look like when you walk on faith on and saying, this could be my path. It may not be clear to me, mm -hmm. but I know what tomorrow will bring. Yeah, I love that faith, trust, and love. That very much aligns with the belief of, that I have, my belief system, which is I think that whatever energy we are putting into the world is the energy we resonate with. And so we end up calling to ourselves and being attracted to those who also 
use maybe slightly different language, you know, like tra uh, faith, trust, and love. And I think of it as the, you know, energy of joy, right? Like, it, but it's the same energy, you know, it's the same energy. And then you find yourself attracted to that, but you also kind of going back to your experience in Bhutan, you know, the monks are joyful and laughing and, and in the moment and present with the, the experiences that they're having from that energy of faith, trust, and love, right? And joy. Yeah. I would have laughter. Add, I would absolutely <laughs> add joy in there, but also being present and anchoring in the moment. Yeah. And I think that's another key to this journey into MCC and, and maybe just, I mean, cause I th I've seen it with ACC and PCC and, and non-coaches, you know, so, I mean, I've seen presence fully show up and, and be fully actualized in a lot of different people who are not coaches. And yet I think coaching is very much, um, it's part of the core of how we are with people, which I think shifts, shifts the, the focus and intentionality of becoming more present. What has this experience as you moved through your different credentials and you continued to get educated in coaching and develop your coaching mastery, what have you learned about yourself, but also just about the process of becoming a coach? One, sometimes I need to, so I always tell in my process, I tell people, oh, you sometimes need to helicopter up on who you are and look down with a curious eye. And what are the things that I see about myself? What are the things that people recognize? And what are the things that I would like to bring in? And how can I triangulate those things to bring it closer to me? Yeah. And so it's in that like being an observer in my own life, right? Stepping away from ego and saying, if I was to look down on me, what would, the, what would I say about my day? Right. And so that's the honing. And so I always talk about and think about, can I hone this a little bit? Just sharpen it slightly, make to tomorrow a little bit better than today was. And so I'll write, I just write down three things. Like that was my top three. And if I could think about what I would do to make tomorrow better and I regress, I mean, everybody regresses. We're human. <laughs> We're human. And sometimes I, I willfully and joyfully regress. <laughs> I want the cookie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm going to lay in bed today. I'm, and I'll be like, you know what? I'm going to lay in bed today or I'm going to take a shower, put on sweatpants and I will be on my couch um, and I will catch up on everything on HGTV or I'll binge. <laughs> and Joyfully. Gonna, Joyfully <laughs> put lasagna in the oven and have a salad and... <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to eat that lasagna all day because um, <laughs> I don't want to cook again and just like relax. Right. And so knowing that sometimes that I'm waking up and deciding that because before it would just happen, mm -hmm. but now I make appointments with myself and I set an end time. Yeah. Right. And I'll be like, Oh yeah, I'm going to lay on this couch all day and eat this, but I'll make an appointment to meet friends maybe at like six 30. So I know it's like my seven to six thirty thing, and then I'll get out. I'll be social. I'll people. I call it peopling. I'll people for a while, and then you know it was a it was a great day for me. And so I think it's in the actualization and really being conscious of making those choices. Sometimes we make those choices and it's unconscious because we've wiped ourselves out. But other times when you have that level of awareness and you can move beyond ego and be like, you know what? I'm looking at my calendar two weeks out. I'm going to be wiped out when I come back from this particular trip. And it, I'm crossing you know, the United States. I'm going to have been there presenting or, or coaching for four or five days. That Saturday, I either need to just decide to, to be at home and cocoon. And then you know maybe I'll go to the beach or get a massage or something like that. And then see some friends that always recharge me. And like intentionally schedule that out and not just wait for life to happen. And I think that's a level of awareness that coaching brought for me. Yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely know that if I don't like to your point, if I don't schedule the downtime, I don't take it. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it, there's always something that'll get in the way of, of sitting there. And I love the other thing that you're, you know, that you're really speaking to, which is if I intentionally decide today's the day, I'm going to be in my sweatpants. I'm going to be eating lasagna while I'm watching TV. As I sit on my couch with my dogs, like that's my intention for the day. I don't have a sense of guilt that I'm not doing something that I'm supposed to be doing because I've intentionally set that time to the side. And so there's a, um, an, a, I have a greater capacity to enjoy myself in that moment, right? Like I can just be like revel in, I don't know, uh, HGTV, which I happen to also love. <laughs> yes. It makes me think I'm handier than I really am. Like <laughs> yes. a evolution. <laughs> That I could do that? That's absolutely not true. I started practicing. I was like, I probably need to call a task rabbit to help me with this. Why did I think I could do this? Uh, or <laughs> yes. It's not really DIY. <laughs> it's the I watch. You should just watch that. <laughs> yeah, change that Y to a W. <laughs> yeah. so it's it's pretty interesting, but like you know, scheduling those days and and it just doesn't happen when I want a break. Sometimes I'll use this skill when I know I want to cry because I feel heavy because of some of the things that's happening in the world, right? Yeah. And specifically after Uvalde, I felt heavy, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and I I was like, you know what? Tonight I'm gonna watch the last four episodes of This Is Us because I've never not watched the episode of This Is Us and shed a tear or two. And I was like, I need a good cry. And this is us could be, could give me that healing wave that I need. And knowing that that's why I was doing it. Like, Like it's totally intentional. Totally intentional, right? And, And intentionally grieving, just being empathetic to what fellow human beings were going through. Mm -hmm. Also knowing that like, it's, it's okay to shed an emotional experience even if I'm just watching it as a third party, right? And mm-hmm. and then think about what kind of action could I take, right? And so one of the differences I always, I talk about between shame and guilt is shame is you hold on to it. Guilt is I'm gonna feel it and then I'll take action. Yeah, I love that because I do think there's different kinds of shame. There's the shame where we feel less than for not a not a valid reason right and and we've maybe been subjected to somebody else's dumping their their baggage or beliefs on us and then there's the shame and i think that you're in if i'm hearing you correctly your language of the guilt where i'm learning from it where i've behaved in a way that i don't feel good about and i need to do something different and i think that and there's that's appropriate (laughs) like we should feel not so good about things we may have done that aren't useful and I also think like to what, so gosh, there's so many things popping up. Have you, okay. So this is a little bit of an aside. There's a show on, I don't know, Apple TV or something called shrinking and, and there's a Harrison Ford character. And I have to say, it's my favorite Harrison Ford character in a really long time, but he's a, he's a therapist and he has this thing where he says every day, put on the music that is going to make you cry for like, and set a timer, you know, your little you know, if you have one of those little tomato timers or something like that for 15 minutes and you just cry for that. And that is your grieving every day. You can just get it out and then you can let it go, move on, do your next thing. And it's almost like, I'm feeling like I'm hearing that from you. And I'm thinking, I I think I need to be setting my timer a little more often because I don't know that I give myself that space that you're talking about enough because there are so many things happening in the world that can feel very overwhelming at times. Absolutely. For me, my typical thing is a hot bath with some Epsom salts. Yeah. At the end of the day. Like I want to shed the day. I want to clear myself so I can mm-hmm. sleep well. And so I do have a whole wind down sleep routine. I was like, I really embrace this self-care, self-awareness thing, part of life. And for me, it, it's not typically a, a session where I need to cry. I, I that, I, that I just found um, overwhelming, but it's normally like, let's sit down, let's watch something, get in the tub, soak, release the day, um, think about what's on my mind, write it down. And it'll be on that piece of paper if I need to pick it up in the morning, but I don't need to lay in bed, flipping it around in my head. Right. 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 You know, and 
And I think, you know, I think a listener could be like, what does this have to do with leadership? But I think it actually has everything to do with leadership. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to the connections that you're making with this and leadership? So one, I always ask my clients when we're working out, I say, what are you doing to take care of yourself? And so I have this 5% methodology that I came up with that you should spend 5% of your day taking care of yourself. 1,440 minutes in a day that works out to 72 minutes. And so I do 30 in the morning, 15 midday and 30 at the end of the day. That's how I kind of started. Mm -hmm. And the, the hot bath is me ensuring that my resilience is, is there for when I need it. Mm -hmm. And that if I have people in my circle that also need to tap into it, that I have something to give because you can't pour from an empty cup. Right. And so it's inside of that practice of extreme self-care that I'm able to lead and step into the moment when needed. And so when I'm working with clients, I'm like, you have to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. You and and self-care and resilience and you know, doing the reset is like hygiene. The shower you took yesterday does not work for you today. <laughs> What? I, I have to take more than one of these showers. <laughs> Correct. Like my five-year-old nephew, he goes, my mommy doesn't make me shower every day. I'm like, I promise your mommy makes you shower every day. I know your mom. <laughs> He's like, why do every time when I come to your house, I have to shower so much. I'm like, cause you're at the beach, baby. You have like sand and sunblock. And I think that's part of lunch. <laughs> We're going to put you in the shower before you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so the sheets will feel so much better <laughs> if you're clean. <laughs> exactly. And he was five. And, and so he was just, you know, my mommy and daddy, and I call my brother. I'm like, tell your son, I know that you make him bathe. And he was like, oh my, he's at that phase right now. And now, you know, he's much older, but it was so cute then. But yeah, the, the, the things that we did yesterday don't necessarily take us forward into today. Mm -hmm. And that's how we get depleted. And we feel like we have nothing left to give. And as somebody who works with people on shaping their lives so that they feel better resilience. I want to be in integrity and ensure that I have those things for myself. And that's not the only thing that I'm doing, but that those are some of the things that I do. Like I believe in two massages a week. If you can do it, I believe like randomly waking up and having breakfast at a place that you love. And it doesn't mean going out to breakfast. I take yogurt and some granola and I'll go and sit by the, the water at the beach in my car. Sometimes I get out and I just watch sunrise, right? I, I live on the coasts. And so doing these kind of things, especially when sunrise is like 6 a.m. in the morning, I can still get up and do that and then go work out and start my work day. And those kind of little things seem like treats, but they also are a bright spot in the week. Yeah. And so, yeah. And it's, it kind of, I mean, it is the way, how do you consistently and intentionally refill your, your bucket, your cup, so that you have the capacity to be present with the people that you work with, with your family, with your friends, most importantly, with yourself, mm -hmm. um, how do you do that? And I think, I mean, this is just brilliant that you're sharing this because I, I think we talk about this a lot. I mean, there's a billion articles on doing these things. And yet I wonder at the number of people who act, actually can create a consistent, um, a consistent integration of these philosophies into their life, you know? Yeah. Mine's everything from like, I have a candle going. What's the scent in the room? Sometimes it's, it's a diffuser going. Um, I have a playlist and I, I just use the, the ones that are already pre-curated, but they'll be like, oh, feeling happy, writing email, waking up in the morning playlist, right? You don't have to overthink it. I have personal ones. I'll let AI also <laughs> create a radio station for me. But like, is music on? Mm -hmm. Like those kind of little things, they matter. And so just being paying some attention and taking two seconds to play some music or to, you know, have a good scent in the house or boil some lemon on the stove in water, all of those things add to me just having a little bit of a richer, more nuanced day that's layered. Yeah. Yeah. And so what does that look like for me? Right. Because, yeah. I mean, there's joy in even getting laundry done. 
quite frankly. Right. Well, I mean, anything you do, I used to, I used to do a lot of couples therapy and people would be like, we never spend any time together. I'm like, well, you can make going to Lowe's for all those DIY projects that you're doing. Um, you can make going to Lowe's a date. I mean, it can be fun. It doesn't have to be just drudgery. So um, I think that's, I think that's also sort of a mindset. And I think that was the other thing that I really was, as I was, um, you know, looking at our conversation coming up and, and that sense of the mindset that one is adopting in order to be able to show up in the ways that they're needed to show up. Yeah. I, I you know, I think figuring out some easy things you can do and then you just hit those and integrate it in and then you normalize it. And then maybe you add a couple more things yeah. That kind of yeah. like work. Like if you're going to watch the food channel, make the food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. One of the best ways for you to be inspired is actually make the dish that they're cooking. And so what does that look like if you were to make something or cook anything? Right. And so I think that's part of, for me, it's like the joy. Also, you know, during the pandemic, when we're in the throes of it, it also helped me bring order to the day. Mm -hmm. right because I'm like okay when you're under duress or stress what can I do to bring myself to my own center well I like baths we'll make them longer mm -hmm. I like <laughs> taking a walk I can do that by myself without seeing people I like going to the beach and I you know our beaches were closed at one point then I'll just go and sit in the parking lot mm -hmm. and eat breakfast I still get to look at the water. I still get to do whatever, right? And so those are the things that I kind of went to, to just make it happy and figure out like, what can I do to get myself through it? The playlist also really, really helped me. Yeah. Um, and so those are the things that I used and learning also, like if I could learn, I like taking a walk and like listening to podcasts and books and things like that. Because if I pick one or two things from it, then I'm going to to learn and I'll figure out a way if I can integrate that in as well. Yeah. Well, and I think there's that thing too, where you hear something and it resonates and you need to kind of noodle around on it for a little while and then figure out how to integrate it into your life. But I really think this is crucial to, for leaders, for coaches. I see anybody going into a business for themselves as a leader, um, but for, you know, and so for coaches, and I saw this when I was a therapist also, but the number of people who are very good at giving ideas to people, you know, like we need to have like these mindfulness practices in order to have this fulfilling life who don't actually practice it for themselves. It's sort of like coaches who don't have a coach or aren't in some mm -hmm. form of supervision for their coaching or, you know, or you know, leaders who live in a silo and they don't get any feedback from the people around them. And they're, you know, in this sense of I'm not happy in my life yet. I'm supposed to be good at what it is that I'm doing. And I, I find that very interesting that, that we know and yet don't practice what we know could be useful. Um, you know, one of the things that it talks about, you know, that you talk about is this idea of leaving behind subject matter expertise and, and really showing up um, in that kind of open mindset. And I'm curious, because I think we kind of talked about like learning to just listen is a big part of that earlier in the conversation, but like what what allowed you to let go of that subject matter expertise? Because our culture, many cultures, not all, but many cultures drive us towards becoming these cult these experts at some, like, I'm an expert at blah, blah, blah. Well, I think one, if you're going to lead people and the higher you get, the less you'll become the expert in very niched areas. And so if you're leading a large team globally, you're not going to be fluent in, you know, a particular dialect, um, know how the local culture at, at, um, integrates the information or the products that you're selling and understand how your company does manufacturing P&L um, and how you can lead people in 12 countries. And so you just need to be 
better at building relationships with the people who are experts in those areas. And a lot of times for my clients, I'm working with them on transitioning into higher roles. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like when you can't save the day? Right. And you just have to be the strong supporter. And so that's a, a different set of skills when you're leading because you need to enroll and inspire the people that are following you on your team, but also build a level of trust and psychological safety that they feel like they can go out and execute, right? And so it's in the contributor safety and then the social exchange for that is the autonomy. People are seeking autonomy from their leaders. Then when you have that, it makes it much easier for my clients to lead, right? But if you feel like you need to be involved in every bit of the process, it's going to be hard to lead because you're going to be exhausted at the end of the day. And so taking people through that transition is one of the joyful parts, I would say, of working with clients, right? For them, for the light bulb to be like, oh, I got it. You're right, right? I let go. And all of a sudden I have time to actually think about strategy and not mm-hmm. tactical execution. And all of a sudden the team starts performing better. I was like, because you gave them the power mm-hmm. to move forward. It's in that autonomy yeah. have in that relationship that allows them to reach their next level. You know, it's so there's such an interesting correlation between the the same sort of taking action on your own the side of well-being, like I'm actually practicing these these practices that are useful for my well-being. And the same thing that happens on the side of a leader moving into the next level of leadership because the you 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 only have so much energy a day. You only have so much capacity a day and if you are focused on trying to micromanage it all or feel like you can't take your hands off any of the wheels, like you must have your hands on every wheel there is, the capacity that you have to do the vision, to think strategically, to, I don't know, be innovative in whatever form of innovation is required in that moment for your organization, it's diminished because you're so busy doing the fundamentals of each and every little thing. And I think that's a struggle too, as people are building a coaching business um, in that we start off not making much money doing coaching, you know, and we're struggling to create a business. And so our first thing is we do everything. Like we learn how to make a website. We learn how to like post to YouTube. We learn how to, you know, keep up on buffer or whatever our social medium, you know, output thing is. And we, you know, we're constantly trying to do it all ourselves. And I think there's something here too, depending on how you want to grow your business and what kind of business you want to have. Very few of us do it alone. We, we need these relationships of these other people who are experts at something that we don't, then don't need to spend hours learning because they already know it (laughs) or have learned it. And I think back to where I was, you know, seven years ago versus where I am now. And yes, sometimes I check my, my company social. I was like, oh, what did we post today? Yeah. <laughs> this not- what have I said? <laughs> my team did a great job and they'll take a clip from a podcast. Or I heard you say that when you were teaching a class. I thought I'd make it a social media quote. And, you know, they think of things and see things that I don't see about myself because it's really hard to read the label on your own jar. Because I'm it is in- very hard to read your label. <laughs> And so, you know, they'll have ideas and I'll be like, oh, do you think? They're like, yes, are you doubting yourself? I'm like, well, I don't know if people are interested in that part, right? Because it doesn't matter if you're an ACC or MCC or on your first day of coach training, we all have doubts about something, right? Because we want to work with and partner with the people that have chosen us and give them what the give them a service that they're looking for so that they can move forward. And so it's in the humility of, do you think you would be interested in this? Right. And that's one of the things I think from coach training and especially, you know, going into the competencies that when it says, is it okay if I make a suggestion to you, feel free to discard it. Yes. Non-attachment. Correct. Right. But this is what popped into my head from what you just shared. And I'll be like, oh my gosh, that was, that's what I was looking for, right? 
But it's in that asking for permission and then giving yourself the ability to say, it's okay if they don't accept it, but I at least wanted to share it, right? And I'll say, this is what I heard. And I remember this from these other conversations. I think you have the pieces of the answer that you've been looking for. I would like to put them together for you. And it's in those kind of conversations that, you know, there's a lot of joyful moments in the coaching relationship where the trust comes in and that they didn't have faith. Like, and my clients would be like, um, I just want to talk and then tell me what you heard. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I'll be like, oh, and it, because they know I listen differently for them. Right. And it was oftentimes I'll introduce it as I'm the keeper of your values. Oh, I love that. Right. And so I'm here to remind you of what the unstressed out version of you would say. Because I asked them to do the values exercise. We all have to do it when we're in coaching school. And I asked them to delineate their values because I'm like, that's your compass. Right. When you're under physiological or psychological duress, if you make a values-based decision, you, you continue to be in alignment. Maybe you're around the corner and you need to square the block, but you won't be two miles off um, when you're in your decision-making process. And so I was like, and it's my pleasure for you to hold on to your values because oftentimes I'll be like, hey, so is this really because that value was triggered or is it the person? And I'll be like, mm-hmm. oh, the value. I was like, how can we reset that for you? And so, so that you, yeah, feel- or what even needs to be explored around that value and around what's showing up so that you can either to our earlier statement, right? Learn from it or let it go. Yeah. 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 And so sometimes I'm like, is this a life is happening to us moment or life's happening for us moment? And we need to learn from it so that we can move forward to the next thing that's waiting for us. And so it's in those kind of like questions that clients are answering that I also oftentimes have to ask myself. I'm like, is it the person or is it me where I am right now? Do I just need to- Can you give an example of what you're talking about? Like, you know, maybe it's a day and everybody's a little bit late. It's whether it's, you know, whatever. But in your mind, in my mind, I had sort of- Nobody has delivered for me today. That's a little bit late. And then like, (laughs) do I just need to go and have a nice lunch, take a nap, reset myself, Mm -hmm. or do a quick like 10 minute, like be present in the moment and say, oh, is life happening to me or is life happening for me? Sometimes when people are, and I had to reframe that very early on, because when you're in the corporate, you're like, boom, 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 boom. And then some, when people are late now, it's like, oh, I wonder what I need, why I needed this a little bit of extra time, right? That's the mindset, like the shift. Oh, they canceled. Oh, something great must be waiting for me on the other side now that I have this block of time. Yeah, I can get something else done. <laughs> yeah, I can get something else done, <laughs> right? I, I can, you know, there's an article I want to read that I can listen to this and do whatever, right? And so sometimes I just ask myself, is life happening to me or is it happening for me? Yeah, I think it's a I think it's a really useful construct for us to be considering because because the attitude of it's happening to me is definitely one of I'm being victimized by whatever this is versus uh, for me, which is what do I have to gain from this? What is the lesson? What is the opportunity? What is the whatever? Right. I love the distinction between the two. Yeah. And so just be like, oh there's something else on the other side of this. I just need to be present and navigate it. May I share an observation, which is faith, trust, and love, I think are crucially important to which mindset you choose. (laughs) (laughs) Right. That's also the question of, is it happening to me or is it happening for me? Right. So if it's happening for me, that's me saying, okay, I'm going to trust that I can play the cards that are being dealt. Right. Uh, and really moving myself forward. And so, yeah, those are the the things kind of look for. And speaking of coaches, I think I have like five. Um, I was like, oh, coaching work. Let me get somebody specifically for this, specifically for this thing, right? And so I'll like drop in and out of different coaching relationships. And one of my uh, coaches that I've worked with for a while always asks, are you judging or are you playing? Are you judging or are you playing? Playing. 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 
right? Because if you're playing, then you're enjoying life. Right. If you're judging, you're going to stop in that moment and take that snapshot and use it to criticize everything. Versus if you're playing, it's going to continue like a movie and something, another scene will set. Yeah. It's like improv in that regard, like life as improv instead of life as a tragic drama. (laughs) Correct. And so I'll even ask myself that question, like, which mode am I in? Like, oh, I should, I shouldn't be in that mode. Like, like, let me just reset that. And I think those are some of the insights that come, right? As you one observe it in other people and you see them make the shift, I'll often say, oh, I'm grateful that they were able to make make that shift to where they wanted to be. And I helped them with bridging the gap. But then I'll be like, oh, are there any shifts I need to make as I do a reevaluation of a period to see Mm -hmm. like, oh, I, I could probably do a little bit better at this. I could organize that drawer next month. Like I could organize one little thing here and it's in those kind of little things that life kind of gets better. And so, I don't know, those are some of the things that I've learned in, in getting to my MCC status. Um, I'm sure the same happened for you. Well, uh, you know, similar for sure, but this, these ideas of, you know, and I could be wrong, but I, I'm the sense that I have as I'm talking to you is just the nature of continual ongoing personal development as part of how we show up as coaches, how we show up as human beings and how we show up in relationships. And I mean, at the end of the day, those are really the only things we have control over in the big schema of the world, right? Is like how we're going to meet the moment. And I, um, you know, and I talk to a lot of coaches and so I, this is something that a lot of coaches talk about, but one of the things that's been unique about you is that you also very much embody it as a practice. And I, I have met other coaches who do also. So I'm not saying this is the first time I've ever heard this. I, I, but I just so appreciate that you are so embodying of these, these principles of how to really be present to yourself and then to others. And, you know, I mean, it's just, I, like I said earlier, I think it's something that a lot of people know and talk about, and yet to put it into practice is that the next le- is the next level. And what that allows for you as you show up with the people that you're working for, like I mean, it's it's crucial because it's very hard to give from an empty uh, empty well. Absolutely, and also when people kind of want to talk to you in the moment, right? Because right? not everything is scheduled. And, you know, I have met MCCs and I'm like, you know, sometimes we just need to have a coach to coach talk and you can reach out. It's okay. Like, I'm not going to consider it like supervisory coaching or anything and understand that people are at the same level of skill that you are. That makes it helpful. Right. Even like most of the times it's business questions. Those are the things that other coaches want to talk about. Like, this is where I am in my business. Can we talk about that? And I'm like, Mm -hmm. oh, well, let's talk about where you're resourced. And I'm like, is it okay if I ask you some coaching questions? And I'm like, yeah. (laughs) I'm like, great. And so we'll go into a little bit of like a five minute laser coach. And I'm like, oh my gosh, why didn't I see that? I was like, I don't know. The same reason I don't see it when I call you. It's hard to read our ingredients on our own jar. (laughs) Uh, Absolutely. And so I'm like, and have you taken a vacation recently? No. Well, why don't you take a vacation and then we'll talk after you come back. Yeah, yeah. we have a, the conversation when they come back like do you feel the same no I needed a vacation I was like this is like the classic two-year-old I needed a nap yeah right? I'm hungry and I need a nap yes. <laughs> or do you need that I need all of don't them. make me take a shower though <laughs> I need all of them and so I'm gonna do that and sometimes taking a vacation is sleeping in your own bed so for me staycations are just as good as a vacation Yeah, especially with the intentionality that you had talked about earlier, you know, we can make, I mean, I don't know, I live in a beautiful place and and there are many things here I could still be exploring, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Many things I could still be exploring from within my own, you know, circle of proximity um, that, that would lead to it feeling 
re I don't know, fulfilling, re regenerative um, inside of me is to that the being available and in the space of being able to hold the space for others, which is, I think, also really just crucial. Like how, I mean, if the air mask drops from the ceiling, first put it on yourself before you help, you know, other people. And again, we know this and yet the, how often are we practicing that capacity on a consistent and regular basis and, and preferably on a daily basis to your point, you know, that 5%, I, I really love that 5% philosophy of self-care because you know, we're not talking about half your day. We're talking about, you know, if an hour and a half or so of your time that you go, I'm worth that. And what does that open up and make available for you to be able to do more of stuff? You know, and it's, Ebony, this is just really, I think just really crucial for leaders, for business owners, for coaches, new, middle, old coaches, every human being on the planet, which is how, if you want to be able to come up with interesting ideas or be able to put yourself out there in new ways in your business or be innovative in some way about what you offer, if you're not doing the self-care required to even have the bandwidth to do that because you're so busy, you know, hopping around trying to like do everything, um, it's, it's going to make that journey take longer. Yes. And, and so it's sometimes after my morning routine, I go into a learning routine. And so what does it look like for me to learn an hour a day, mm -hmm. right? So I'll do the meditation, do the reset, learn for a bit. And then like, what came up for me? And then leave it until the next time I have another one of those sessions. But that's where the ideation for me really comes from. And in the beginning, you know, I'm trying to understand, I was trying to understand things like, understand things like adult development theory. What does it look like? Reading all the people that are known for organizational research and consuming talks. And I think that's really where it came from, mm -hmm. right? Like I want to be able to give people factual things, things that have been researched, things that are an intuitive hit to help them with what could align with them. And as they built, as they close the gaps for themselves. And I think that's a lot where the learning kind of uh, flow came from. You just said something that I think is crucial too, which is people talk a lot about intuition and I, I love intuition. I think intuition is, is um, our capacity to access our internal workings. But to your point, if I don't learn things, I don't have access to have an intuitive hit about those things that I don't know. And so I, I just had this conversation with somebody on my YouTube channel, which was, you know, how did you have the, how did you intuitively use that particular word in that coaching conversation. And I was like, well, it's just intuitive. And then I'm like, but it's only intuitive because of all this other stuff. I know it informed my intuition. And so I think your point is absolutely crucial, which is whatever it is that you are excited about, passionate about, care about in the work that you're doing with the people that you're working with research it so that your intuition expands as to when people are talking about that, you go, Hey, I'm having a bit of an intuitive hit on X. And I'm curious if that's even useful to you. And I love that you brought that forward. So I really appreciate you, you speaking that out into the space. Absolutely. And sometimes, you know, it's more about like, I know that this is a very pragmatic client. If I can give them some facts based on yeah. the things that I think could help them move forward that helps them with adoption right and so right. what does that look like and so if I, I have those things you know available kind of indexed away but hey I have an article I'm going to share with you on that I think it aligns yeah. with where you are and where you would like to go yeah and if nothing else you can read it and go no that's not it but you've gotten something that you can I mean knowing what we don't want is almost as important if not even more important than knowing what we do want because because it gives us information, right? That we can then make decisions from. Oh my gosh, this has been just a delight to talk to you today. I feel like I could talk to you for a lot longer. This has just been beautiful. Um, and I just love your energy as we're talking. You're very 
calming for me for um <laughs> I feel very like I was regenerated in the conversation so I really appreciate this um as we go to a close I typically ask everybody and I'd be very curious what your answer to this is is if you were writing your your autobiography in this moment today what would you title it seven steps to resilience seven steps to resilience yeah Beautiful. i think i focus a lot on resilience and what does it look like and it comes up a lot for me when i'm working with clients in my practice yeah. and really like are we do am i doing the things to get me there um and so something around resilience um something around like shifting personal transformation like really I think you can power your own transformation but you have to decide you want to invest a little bit every day and what does that look like for me you know um yeah it's something around resilience transformation um and when I look back as coaches always do I see things that gave me signals about the life I have now. Mm-hmm. When I was in school, I was the president of a club called Student Facilitators. We were this, I know. It was in high school. You just can't make this stuff up. <laughs> yeah. We were the group that was a club attached to the guidance counselors. And at lunchtime, we would take turns manning shifts to help people with their college selection process and suggest schools and let them know about Um, speakers that were coming from some of those schools and then help them get appointments with the guidance counselor and stuff like that. And I was like, I was a student facilitator. I was a resident advisor when I was in college, all these things. And I was like, but I went to school for chemistry. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there is the inherent, um, inherent appreciation and enjoyment of an experience. And then there's what we think we're supposed to do. So, you know, (laughs) Sometimes it takes a little bit of time for those two things to, to merge. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think it's always sort of being aware, but not being intentional about the power of resilience and transformation in my life. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for being on the show. Just for all the listeners who are listening, um, you can find links to Ebony below and go to the website. You can capture the transcript if you want. And thank you again, Ebony, so much for being on the coaching studio today. Thank you so much. I appreciate our conversation.